I would like to uh, welcome everybody tonight to the interdisciplinary panel discussion. The subject is a collaborative approach to cancer survivorship and mental health. We have a very talented panel, panel here tonight, um, and I will just briefly go um, through each panel member. Uh, Meg Rindeman is a, a survivor of recurrent Hodgkin's disease and hormone positive breast cancer. Um, you'll be able to see her full bio on the MHPM website. But I'd just like to ask you, uh, Meg, is resilience a, a family tray in your family? <laughs> uh, yeah, possibly. I, I suppose it is, yes. Yeah. Because it comes through very much in your story. Uh, yeah, I, I think it, it becomes learnt too after such a long journey. Uh, you, you learn how to survive. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Um, the, um, the next person that I'd like to introduce is um, Associate Professor Michael Jefford, an oncologist. Um, Michael is based in Melbourne uh, and is associated with the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. Uh, he's also Senior Clinical Consultant at Cancer Council Victoria. Michael, may I ask, uh, just ask you, um, when did you first become uh, interested in the psychological aspect of cancer care? Oh. <clears throat> um, for a long time. I thought I was going to be a psychiatrist before I uh, did, ended up uh, changing courses. So I, I was interested in uh, psychiatry as a medical student and uh, I guess I've always been interested in the psychological aspects of healthcare, so I've probably always combined um, some sort of um, interest in psychosocial care with uh, clinical with clinical oncology care, and and a lot of my practice and a lot of my research has that kind of uh, angle. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. And the third panelist we have tonight is Dr. Craig Hassett, a GP. Uh, Craig is based in Melbourne and Victoria. And Craig also has a, has a great interest in, in the mind-body continuum and mind-body medicine. Has that been a, a lifelong um, thing, Craig, or is it something that you developed during med school or after you qualified? No, I think I uh, maintained my interest uh, from, well, from you know, when I was uh, uh, in secondary school and uh, just being aware of my own body and mind and noticing that they are related, I think I maintained that interest in spite of my medical education, not because of it. <laughs> That's a very, very good answer. And the fourth person I'd like to introduce is, is Professor Phyllis uh, Butel. Uh, Phyllis uh, is a clinical psychologist. Um, she has built up a, a team of researchers um, based in New South Wales and, and, and throughout the country. And, and primarily um, works with the University of Sydney. And she's interested in uh, developing um, psycho-oncology research in Australia. Uh, she's worked with many uh, different disciplines, um, and her present research interests are within the field of health psychology. Again, may I ask you, uh, Phyllis, how did you first become involved with, uh, with cancer and medical care and the mind-body continuum? Well, I think like uh, many things, it was a certain amount of luck in that I got out of my PhD, which had actually been on eating disorders, looked for a job, and the first job that I got was uh, working on a cancer research project. And I've stayed ever since because it's a fantastic area. Cancer is something that affects everybody in the community. And there are you know, so many issues that people face in this area, I've never got, um, you know, there's never a, a dull moment in terms of research and the issues that, that um, need to be addressed. So I've stayed in it ever since. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. And the final and, and fifth person on our panel tonight is Professor David Cassain. Um, David is an academic psych psychiatrist, a psycho-oncologist, researcher and author. Um, he's currently the head of psychiatry for Monash University in Australia, but has recently taken up a, a very senior position in, in, in the US uh, working um, in oncology and uh, psychotherapy. He ha uh, has written many papers, is the author of many books. His bio is available on the MHPN um, site, um, and uh, we welcome him here tonight. David, may I ask you, um, 
Why did you decide to do psychiatry? Good evening, Michael. Um, first of all, I uh, spent a decade in general practice, actually, and uh, then came to psychiatry. The last 25 years have been a combination of uh, psycho-oncology and palliative care. And uh, you said I was just heading off to the US, but indeed I've just come back from a decade in the US uh, uh, after uh, having had a period of time working in palliative care with the University of Melbourne. I went across to Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre for a decade and then uh, have been for this past year back in Australia. Very delighted to be back here and uh, working again with Monash University, uh, which was one of my alma mater. Thank you very much for sharing that with us, David. That's, um, that's, that's very instructive. Uh, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Michael Murray. I'm a GP in Townsville. Um, I have facilitated um, many uh, of the MHPN uh, webinars. Uh, my main interests are in um, family practice, um, mental health care, and I have worked in Headspace, um, which as you know is the Youth Mental Health Initiative. Um, presently being rolled out through Australia. Um, I would now um, just like to move on a little bit and we'll just go um, to just some ground rules. Um, we're very, very um, uh, privileged to have you all um, log in tonight. We have had over 850 people register. I think we're up to about 250 people who've logged on. More people will log on as the evening goes on. Um, some of us um, are, have just gone into darkness. Some of you have been in darkness for an hour or so. Some of us are still in light in, in Western Queensland, Western New South Wales, South Australia, Western Australia and Darwin. Uh, some are on the way home. Some of you may be on your iPads on a train somewhere logging into this. So we, 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 we welcome you all here tonight. Um, we are more than happy for you to post comments into the chat box. Uh, your feedback is very, very, very important to us. We have three learning objectives for tonight. The first is to better understand the mental health indicators in the context of cancer survivorship. The second is to identify the key principles of the featured disciplines approach in screening, diagnosing, and supporting people who have survived cancer and may be experiencing depression and or anxiety. And thirdly, um, to explore tips and strategies for interdisciplinary uh, collaborative care for people who have survived cancer and may be experiencing uh, depression and or anxiety. Now, we are just about to start our presentations. And the order of presentations will go in the order that I have introduced the panelists. And I am now going to um, move uh, over to Meg and ask her to present um, her presentation. Thank you, Michael. Do you need a disabled parking sticker for when you go home? Have you tried music therapy? In over 20 years of various cancer treatments, hospitalizations and recoveries, these were the only approaches made to me by mental health practitioners. As both an inpatient and outpatient, doctors, nurses and treatment staff were caring, kind and concerned. They asked me how I was feeling physically, but never how I was coping, how my partner or my kids were doing, whether any of us might need support. Survivorship is part of the cancer journey. After the unpredictable roller coaster ride of the treatment phase, the doctor's visits, the biopsies, the scans, the chemo, the radiotherapy and the surgeries, survivorship is about the slow, painful return to health, the follow-ups, the odd and unexplained side effects and ongoing concerns over the tiniest aches and pains, the impact on partners, carers, family and friends, their concerns when a new symptom or potential issue emerges, the emotions surrounding annual checkups. Survivorship is about restarting your life. It's about understanding that this immediate threat to your mortality has passed. It's about accepting the changes, understanding the new normal, 
incorporating the scars, the loss of function and the limits, and about waking up each morning to face a new day. Over a lengthy journey, practice and methodologies change and improve. Where 20 years ago support services were not available, today cancer patients and survivors are offered a wide range of resources and supports to assist, educate and inform them. I hadn't heard the term supportive care screening or distress thermometer until I began to volunteer for the Survivorship Centre at Peter Mac. Recently, when I felt I needed to talk to someone prior to making a, de a decision around mastectomy, I had to ask the breast care nurse whether she knew of a psychologist or mental health worker who focused on women with breast cancer. The information had not been forthcoming as a matter of course. I wonder whether this has been due to the fact that apart from a lengthy hospitalisation for a stem cell transplant, I've been a user of the private system. Mostly it seems, and certainly in my experience, supportive care is not a term well utilised around cancer in private practice. None of my oncologists or my GPs ever suggested that I might need support around my emotional or psychological well-being. Maybe it's because I'm confident, well-spoken, capable, an English speaker, perhaps the lack of tears and histrionics. Did my doctors and medical teams feel that I was okay, coping, well able to advocate for myself? No one ever inquired. Or was I lucky to have pushed on doors and found answers where I fear many others do not? And what happens to the others? the ones who don't have the words, who are intimidated by the system. Do they muddle on, fall through the cracks? For me, there are a number of elements that speak loudly arising from over 20 years of cancer treatments and survivorship. Supportive care and the apparent inequality with which it's administered, the lack of interdisciplinary coordination and communication, the lack of any record, care plan, to link the various care and treatment streams with the patient and each other. It must be difficult to identify survivors who might be experiencing anxiety or depression if after the treatment and follow-up stages of the cancer journey, the patient is sent back to their GP with little liaison from the oncology team. My sense is that the ownership of a care plan would create that dialogue and empower survivors. They and their relevant healthcare professionals would all be armed with a tool that would inform each survivor's future, not one that would pathologise their survivorship, but one that would assist them to find a starting place to answers if and when necessary. Issues of case coordination, management and advocacy might be discussed openly in pursuit of a holistic biopsychosocial model. As each patient is an individual, each plan would be flexible enough to be modified to meet the particular patient's needs and information requirements. Many cancer patients move into survivorship with no need for additional follow-up or support. Treatment and surveillance completed, they transition on to the next phase of their lives. As a survivor though, it's easy to get lost to the system. You may move from one cancer stream to another. Side effects or late effects may require the services of different specialists. The demands and changes to general practice allow less time for relationship building, for follow-up, for talking. If one regards survivorship as the post-treatment phase of the cancer journey, who undertakes the management of the survivor? The oncologist, the cancer hospital, a survivorship clinic, the practice or clinic nurse, the GP or the survivor themselves? The answer to this question would go a long way to changing the system and offering pathways for identifying and referring survivors who might not be coping. As healthcare professionals, you are in the unique position to affect change, to smooth the roller coaster ride. You are hands on and offer your skills, your training and empathy to your patients. You are in a position to create the dialogues, to work collaboratively, to establish networks. If you are mindful of your patients' holistic needs, if you listen to them and hear their concerns, you can help them to find the supportive care they need. Thanks, Michael.
Thanks very much, Meg, for an excellent presentation, which, which is making us all think. Um, we will now move on to Michael Jeffords, who will um, uh, make his presentation in response to Meg's story. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, Thanks very much. Uh, Thanks very, very much. Difficult to follow uh, Meg. Um, she always speaks so well and so, so well. poignantly. Uh, poignantly to, um, to reflect on, on what Meg's just said. Uh, I'm going to be speaking. It's a, I feel that my presentation is a little bit dull in comparison, um, but I'll just try and give a little bit of a perspective on uh, issues in terms of providing better care for people after they finish their cancer treatment, and partly to reflect on Meg's story that I'm sure uh, most people will have had the chance to have read, uh, to read. So I think that the, uh, I think of there being a number of challenges in terms of providing. Uh, improved care for cancer survivors. And by cancer survivors, I'm really, as Meg suggested, that the term has been used to, uh, in different ways. Um, but we tend to think of cancer survivors, particularly in Australia, largely we use that term to refer to people who have completed cancer treatment. And often uh, the terms used to describe people who have had a good outcome and appear to be cancer free. So one of the happy challenges is that we have a, a very large and growing number of cancer survivors, and that's partly because of increased detection, but it's also because of better treatments. Um, we'll come in a moment to discuss the breadth of issues that survivors can experience, but Meg's story, I think, has highlighted already um, a, a huge number of issues that people can experience immediately after completing treatment and in the, the weeks, months, and years afterwards. Um, that's, of course, important because uh, not, uh, an approach that's one size fits all isn't going to suit. Uh, there's an enormous variation between survivors, and so we need a system that's flexible to that. Having said that, uh, we have to recognize, and I'm sure everybody who's part of this uh, webinar uh, will be acutely aware of the limited health workforce. So the question then is how do we use that most effectively to provide better care? A further challenge is uh, that we have imperfect evidence and guidance. So how often should we be seeing people? What tools should we be used for screening? Who are the people that should be seeing cancer survivors? Much of this, um, much of this is, uh, is unknown at this stage or there's imperfect evidence. Press the right button. So a number of years ago, we were interested in uh, understanding whether issues that uh, Australian cancer survivors experience uh, whether they're typical of uh, that that we know in the literature. And so and the, the first um, box in the middle of the screen um, really just, uh, is a paper about um, results from focus groups with, that we did with Australian cancer survivors and a range of health professionals to determine what are, what are the issues that uh, people experience in Australia. Uh, and I'll come to that in just a moment, but we use that information to inform the uh, development of uh, the first general information booklet for cancer survivors uh, that's now a national resource available through Cancer Council. Um, and we also used it to develop a DVD, which at the time was the, uh, the first DVD uh, for cancer survivors as well. So the sorts of issues that people experience, um, and many of these uh, you'll hear in Meg's story, uh, first of all, people can have very varied reactions to finishing treatment. We know that some people are uh, you know, it's a time of great joy uh, to have finished all of their cancer treatment and to be at the end of it. But many other people uh, can feel quite lost and abandoned, particularly people who have had a, a lot of very intense contact with the cancer center, the hospital. Uh, they can kind of wonder, well, what happens now? Uh, in Meg's story, we heard about persisting uh, side effects from treatment. We'll be discussing at length tonight about uh, emotional and psychological issues that people can experience. There are side effects that can develop later, so-called late effects. Meg's story talks about uh, damage caused by radiotherapy um, and also the fact that people can develop another cancer uh, because of their previous treatment. And, and in Meg's circumstance, uh, the fact that she developed breast cancer uh, is strongly linked to previous radiotherapy in, uh, for treatment of lymphoma and it may well have been a consequence of uh, treatment for lymphoma. Um, in Meg's story also, she talks about the impact on relationships and family and also uh, practical issues in terms of return to work, finances, etc. Um, however, and I'm, I'm sure we will talk about this, uh, this, 
there is the opportunity, um, and I guess that many people do experience uh, growth and something positive from uh, a very challenging and difficult experience. So um, the, the uh, quick plug for where uh, I work at Peter Mac, so Australian Cancer Survivorship Centre. Um, in I don't know whether you can see my arrow, but in the middle of the the home page, which actually now has Meg on the front page, uh, but in the middle of the home page, you can click on a link to the the DVD that I talked about previously. Um, I think that appears on the next slide. Uh, so you'll see that there are a number of chapters on reactions to finishing treatment, coping, physical consequences, etc. So you can see all that online, and we're very happy to supply the DVD as well. So thinking about how do we improve care, we recognize that um, care currently is not as good as it could and should be. Uh, and we do have some guidance. Uh, this is one report, and it has been very influential. Uh, it was produced by the US Institute of Medicine. It's called From Cancer Patient to Cancer Survivor, Lost in Transition. And it was published in 2006. Uh, the person on the right-hand side is Patty Gans, who has been, has been very influential uh, around survivorship, and she's based at UCLA. Um, and she speaks in a, a video that's available on YouTube. Um, I've just typed in from cancer patient to cancer survivor lost in transition, but we'll supply you with the link to that. It goes for about 17 minutes, and it's excellent. Uh, it talks about the sorts of issues that survivors can experience, uh, the shortfallings in the healthcare system, and although it talks about the US, I think that um, they'll feel very familiar uh, to Australian audiences too. And it talks about some of the issues uh, and some of the responses that they suggest, including the use of survivorship care plans that Meg uh, just alluded to. So um, I just want to finally just talk about uh, some essential components of survivorship care recommended by this uh, Institute of Medicine report. So in providing better care for people after completing cancer treatment, we'd like to be able to, uh, where possible, obviously prevent recurrent and new cancers, but we'd also like to be able to prevent late effects. We want to be able to prevent the damage that radiation causes. Uh, we want to prevent it from causing second cancers, etc. We would like to be able to conduct some sort of surveillance, not just for cancer spread and recurrence, but the sorts of medical and psychosocial late effects that people might experience. Again, we'll talk about that, but we know that people can experience a number of issues, and we can screen for those sorts of things. We should be intervening uh, for medical problems, such as lymphedema, sexual dysfunction, symptoms such as pain and fatigue, distress that can be just as prevalent in caregivers as survivors. I'm sure we'll talk about that too. And also these practical issues such as employment, insurance, and disability. And critically, and again as Meg talked about, the importance of good care coordination. So people uh, don't fall through cracks so that it's not just hit and miss. Uh, and that needs to be good co coordination between the survivor and their family, but also providers in the community, whether that's their GP or other providers, as well as other specialists that might be based in a hospital, cancer centre, etc. So that's the uh, end of my introductory comments. Uh, back to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Michael. That was an excellent presentation and, and covered a lot in five minutes. Thank you, thank you very, very much. We will now move on to uh, Craig Hassett, um, our, our GP, for his um, contribution. Hello, everybody. Good. I'll just move the, uh, the slides on. So just from a general practitioner perspective, um, uh, I think that there's a lot that can be done and it sounded like from, uh, from Meg's experience there were some things that would have been very helpful that uh, either weren't asked about or weren't provided. Certainly a GP is one of the people who might be in a position to provide some of this uh, other care but also linking in with uh, a whole range of allied health professionals and perhaps support groups and community services that might add a lot of value to um, uh, to Meg's uh, experience of going through cancer and the treatments, um, but also to um, um, improve the quality of, of life as well. Um, from an integrative medicine approach, um, very often I think as doctors we focus on the, the physical and the medical therapies and, uh, and as important as they are, we can get so uh, focused on that that we don't see anything else. And uh, 
it's a sort of like a selective blindness that I think we sometimes get and we're not sometimes aware of other things that could be provided where perhaps um, not uh, asking uh, the patient about other things that could be useful. One model that uh, we develop and we certainly teach our medical students at Monash University about is uh, the ESSENCE uh, model, the ESSENCE of self-care and that's an acronym that stands for education stress management, spirituality, exercise, nutrition, connectedness and environment. And for me there are seven boxes that um, really should be thought of not as, a, as a, an occasional thought but uh, as a standard part of care. And that can start right from uh, within the hospital having the, the initial cancer treatment to start to put that on the, the agenda, agenda to think about after the event <clears throat> of going through the initial cancer treatments but also within the, uh, the general practice when a patient uh, uh, seeks follow-up. Uh, stress management really stands for the whole mind-body <clears throat> sort of area and the importance of things like mindfulness. Spirituality can mean a lot of different things to different people, so where we find meaning and purpose in our lives. It could be through religion, but for many people it's not through religion, but it's through other things that make life meaningful, like uh, relationships and um, playing a part in life or making a contribution in uh, ways that are important in, in the world. Uh, Meg's doing exactly that, I think, uh, right now, and then the kind of uh, support that she's given to uh, many, many cancer patients uh, around Australia and um, probably around the world as well. For me, that's spirituality, that's meaning. The importance of physical activity and nutrition, of course, um, and these things have a significant impact uh, on a person's well-being. Um, but also on outcomes so and how well a person copes with treatments. And so these can be wonderful adjuncts, as is connectedness, our social support and relationships, and the importance of a healthy environment, not just the physical environment, but also the emotional environment, everything from the hospital to where we live, the parks and the open spaces, um, uh, the social environments that we go into. So environment's a very broad concept. All of these um, could be applied to the essence uh, of um, mental health as well. That there's important things that, uh, from all of those categories that can impact on mental health and well-being. And I would hope that one day that this sort of total or holistic or integrated care would be standard management and not an occasional add-on. I think that people can learn a lot about this from support groups and programs and um, they could be run within practices but uh, very often there are lots of community groups that uh, can provide these, this sort of support. One of the things that I've certainly had a strong personal and professional interest in is, uh, is the role of mindfulness and I'm sure a lot of the, uh, the mental health professionals uh, that are a part of this, um, uh, this webinar will be very aware of it and are actively engaged in getting training and uh, teaching it. Um, mindfulness uh, would be important, I think, for a whole range of reasons and each person might have their own particular motivation or context, but for improving mental health and resilience, coping not just with the disease but the symptoms and coping with the uh, treatments um, because it has a range of physical health benefits. Uh, so um, reducing the stress response, improved immunity, re less inflammation, um, changes in um, DNA uh, function and repair. So there's a whole fascinating area of, uh, of research there. Enjoyment in life, uh, enrichment through more engagement and being more present, and certainly acceptance. And acceptance um, because life is changing, so roles are changing, what we can or can't do might be changing. And one day for all of us, uh, sooner or later, the whole issue of acceptance as well around death and dying and that how, the, how can things like mindfulness help us to, to flow through that and not just to help ourselves but also for family and friends that uh, have gone the journey with a person who's uh, been living with cancer for some years. So these are some of the things that uh, certainly as a GP myself I'm very interested in but also working with um, cancer support groups. I feel that a lot more could be provided for people with cancer. My experience has been that mostly, mostly these things do not uh, come under the radar um, and uh, many patients feel like they have to go outside of the healthcare system or conventional healthcare system to try and find these elements um, themselves. And I, 
I would hope that, that many people don't put themselves at risk sometimes by flying blind in terms of um, uh, um, maybe sometimes pursuing approaches and uh, therapies uh, that uh, may not always be um, safe and healthy. So there are a few of, uh, of my thoughts I'd like to offer in relation to Meg's case and uh, put before uh, people to consider uh, in our discussion later on. Thank you very much, uh, Craig. It, that, was a, that was an excellent presentation from the general practitioner point of view and also from the, the integrative point of view and, uh, and, and of course, from the mind, mindfulness point of view, which I can see from, from the comments uh, coming in from our participants is, uh, is very much appreciated. We will now move uh, over to you, David, um, our psychiatrist, for your presentation. To, to Phyllis. Oh, uh, pardon me, yes, my mistake. We will now move over to Phyllis, um, our clinical psychologist, for her presentation. I do apologize. So, thank you, Michael. Um, so I'm going to just refer to some of the things that I thought about listening to me. I think it really does remind us that um, having survived cancer is not an, an easy journey. There are challenges and it certainly takes time to recover from um, a cancer diagnosis and all of the treatment that that involves. And there's now been many, many studies that have shown that overall cancer survivors have poorer health than the, than the general population, not only in terms of uh, long-term side effects and physical issues, but also psychological and emotional um, challenges. And one of those issues um, that people who have survived cancer live with every day is the fear of the cancer coming back. And it's a rare cancer survivor that, um, that doesn't wake up, particularly on mornings when they have to go back and see the doctor, with a, a level of anxiety about the cancer coming back. And for some people that can really prevent them from planning for the future and moving on. I, I think another um, emotional issue that Meg has alluded to is the, the, the almost identity crisis that comes with um, being a cancer survivor. Um, it does change you and people struggle to find a new normal or who they are at, you know, now that they're uh, cancer treatment is finished, but um, they're still they're still changed. And then people also need to live with the expectations of other people and uh, work out how they're going to respond to that. Sometimes they're expected to be grateful because they've survived, or or heroic, um, which they may not feel they are, or they're expected to be just as they were before. And and um, as we've just said, that's rarely the case. And. In addition to those things, uh, there are the long-term side effects that um, a number of people have already alluded to, both the physical problems that people are left with, such as lymphedema and long-term fatigue. They might have gone through a premature menopause. They might have sexual difficulties as a result of treatment. And they also may be at higher risk of other health problems which they need to live with. I also think that um, Meg's story really um, brings home uh, the message that it's not just the cancer survivor that's affected by this whole experience, it's also um, the, the survivor's family. And, and again, we know from research that family members can be as distressed um, or more distressed than the survivor. They worry about um, how the survivor's coping, they fear for the future both for the person who survived and for themselves. Um, and they may have to have changed their role if the survivor can't do things that they used to do and there may be intimacy and sexual issues that they struggle with. And I think um, if the system fails patients, it probably fails family, family even more um, and we, we even more rarely ask about how the family is doing. So I think that's something that's worth uh, discussing as well. Uh, Michael noted this and so did Meg that... Um, it, you know, there, there can be positive outcomes as well and we, we do want to remember those. Um, and certainly in a study that I and some colleagues did some years ago, um, the majority of people reported at least one positive outcome as a result of their cancer, particularly the women, I should add. Um, and as a result of the cancer, people said they focus more on things that are important. They've, they've made positive changes to their life. Uh, they feel they've grown as a person. Um, and they appreciate their relationships with other people more. So it, 
it can lead to some positive changes. Now Meg talked about the distress thermometer and if you haven't seen that, um, this is a distress thermometer and it's a great way of avoiding people slipping through the, the um, cracks and unless someone asks or unless people feel brave enough to say that they want some support, they often do fall between the cracks. So the distress thermometer um, is a single item where people just indicate on the thermometer how distressed they are. And if they score over around four, um, that suggests that they've got enough distress that it's, it's probably something they need, help, need support with and need um, help with. Um, and they can then tick a whole lot of these boxes on the right to indicate what the issues are that are causing them distress, which can help health professionals work out what they should be doing to, to better support that person. So in my view, any time somebody um, turns up in, in a hospital or in a GP's clinic, if they had the distress thermometer thrust in front of them and they had the opportunity to um, just reflect for a moment on how they are travelling and give some feedback that might allow someone to um, suggest something that might be helpful, we might let fewer people fall between the cracks. I did just want to finish um, reflecting on this um, by commenting on the fact that there are different models for care um, in terms of a multidisciplinary um, group um, such as ourselves tonight and this is one article which has um, explored that. Now this last slide is, I'm, I'm sorry, very busy but if you just focus on the figure um, in the top, the first uh, model A uh, unfortunately is what often happens now where somebody develops cancer, their GPs drop out of the picture the care focuses on uh, the oncology team. There's very poor communication between what's going on in hospital and what's going on in the community to, to I think, the detriment of the patient. And what this uh, article is suggesting is that a better model of care is a shared model where, where there's care both in the community and through the oncology team, which is not just the oncologist, I should say, but could um, involve all sorts of uh, allied health um, nursing care as well as medical care and that the communication between the two is achieved through, as Meg said, a survivorship care plan where everybody's on the same page about where that person is heading, what sort of support they need, what sort of follow-up they need um, and there can be communication and support between the GP and the oncology team if that's, if that's necessary. So, you know, there are different models, this is just two of them, but I think we can also explore this further. So I'll hand back to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Phyllis. That was a very, very interesting presentation and has given us much to think about. And finally, uh, we, were, we will move over to David, our psychiatrist, for his presentation. Thank you very much, David. Thanks very much, Michael. Thanks very much, Michael. It's um, been the case, I think, that each of the speakers have spoken about the longer term and late effects. When I talk to oncologists about these, they tell me that uh, again and again they introduce these notions to patients when they first consent to treatments, such as chemotherapy regimens or uh, radiation therapy. But I think uh, we need to keep in mind that it's quite a stressful time for people when they're agreeing to those initial cancer therapies and uh, it's often the case that they don't remember uh, some years later that these particular risks have been considered. And so that, that becomes part of our presentation tonight to emphasize the importance once remission is achieved, once the primary treatment's finished, to go back to the patient and really create a care plan that uh, deals with and summarizes all of those risks and works out management that flows on from there. Now, people have talked about the fear of recurrence and uh, Meg herself commented on how aches and pains uh, occur through the years and uh, that, of course, brings what I call an existential threat, the uncertainty of whether that cancer will return, whether the threat of death will come back in the future. And it's really a lifelong coping challenge to deal with that. And we've talked about uh, anxiety and depression being possible. And I just pick up at the bottom of that slide on the potential for 
impact on the family. Also these days as more and more uh, familial aspects of cancer are being picked up and uh, people are having genetic tests. So that can also have uh, an impact. The work that Kevin Offinger has done across the US in following a very large cohort of uh, adolescents, children who were treated for cancer, followed them across 30 years into adulthood, tells much of the story of the potential problem of these late effects. And we see that over 30 years, uh, these people, three quarters of them, carry a chronic health condition. And uh, many have functional limitations and 42% severely disabled. I've seen patients that have had uh, two and three cancers occurring as secondary cancers uh, 20 to 30 years after their primary cancer was treated. And at a cancer center in the US, like the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, in fact, 16% of our new patient admissions were for second or third cancers rather than the first cancer occurrence. We anticipate that as the community ages, uh, that we'll see one in five people coming along with a second or third cancer. And then uh, cardiac Excuse disease. Excuse me, David. Uh, yes. It's uh, Michael Murray here. We're just having a, a little a bit, a bit of a problem hearing you. Is it possible to reposition your microphone a little bit? I'll bring that in a little bit, Michael. That, that's helpful? much, much better. Thank you. Thank you for alerting me to that. And here from the Childhood Survivorship Study, 17% uh, of, uh, of these folk carried problems with anxiety, depression, somatization where people are focusing on their body and worrying about those aches and pains. Uh, so if we look at some of these post-treatment issues, one point to make is that adaptation occurs across many months or years. It's not necessarily a quick fix and a number of patients are so focused on their initial treatment that it's only when treatment's finished that they start to come to terms emotionally with what's happened to them. And they may spend the next two or three years uh, putting all of that into perspective, perspective. It's very important, of course, to encourage survivors to move to active rehabilitation. Exercise is one example. And this idea of bodily vigilance, I think, is, is highly understandable, where people develop an ache or pain that uh, they immediately start to wonder, is this the cancer returning? And uh, the bodily vigilance is important um, to, in fact, ensure that they get appropriate treatment. But they can't uh, magnify the effect of that worry and allow that to have a spoiling effect on their life. And that's where I think uh, psychologists and uh, Psycho-oncologists can be helpful with a cognitive behavioral approach to helping patients put those particular bodily symptoms into perspective and not allow them to become a, a too much of a focus for worry. We recognize that about one in five patients one year out after their cancer has been treated struggle to return to work and that shows some of the challenge of rehabilitation. And all of this then points both the longer term and late effects to the need uh, to build up a future care plan that has an emphasis on health promotion and well-being as we take the cancer survivor forward. So they need help with all sorts of issues that may include uh, early menopause, sexual functioning and fertility problems. Uh, many patients will need an annual thyroid blood test particularly if they've had radiation that's covered the thyroid area. If they've had treatment with some of the modern lymphoma medications like rituximab, then they may have a need for increased vaccination to help them uh, uh, overcome problems like uh, the flu uh, and even pneumococcus vaccination is recommended to protect people against uh, the development of pneumonia. Patients, I, I find, uh, when they develop a secondary cancer, uh, often have a concern, was it picked up early enough? And uh, many of them won't have known that they could well have started surveillance uh, at an earlier age than the general community. And it very much depends on uh, when their cancer was treated and if one then uh, talks to their oncologist about what to do 10 and 15 years out, it may mean that... Uh, uh, mammography or other sorts of tests, cholesterol checks, cardiac function tests, 
are important to, to bring into a care plan and have them engage with. The majority of people over the 6 to 12 months after their cancer is treated show a return to normal quality of life uh, measure, measures, but uh, their, their need for this screening and health promotion is really lifelong from that time forward. So what I think we've got to help patients to accomplish here is the development of what I call a new health literacy about cancer survivorship. That is a new understanding of what it means to be a cancer survival, survivor. And here I take Howard Leventhal's model of how patients understand their illness in a common sense way. And Leventhal identifies these five key domains that patients need to think about as they uh, address the concept that they're now a cancer survivor. That that survivorship carries a risk across life. It has a real identity like that. There are timelines for their threats. Some threats will come on uh, five years out, ten years out. Some won't come until 20 to 30 years have gone by. And they need to understand those timelines. They need to have an understanding of what the consequences would be if they missed screening tests, health promotion tests, cancer screening. And uh, that links in very much with understanding the way that chemotherapy may put them at risk for perhaps a, a leukemia 10 or 15 years later, how radiation therapy can produce a number of secondary cancers. Meg's an example of a secondary breast cancer, a thyroid cancer, tongue, head and neck cancers are common when people have had mantle radiation as Meg did. And so all of this uh, leads to the concept that illness may well be controllable and pre uh, early diagnosis may be important. If it's not uh, preventable, then uh, we need to recognize it and get in and treat it quite early. So that's been my effort to give a perspective of uh, what's involved there. Michael, I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much, David, for an excellent presentation, which has given us all much to think about. Now, the next segment of the uh, webinar, we would normally have uh, questions, uh, panel members posing questions to each other, but this is such a broad topic and um, such an important topic that we've decided to just have a free-flowing conversation. And each panel member can, has given me some conversation starters, but we're going to go back to Meg again. And Meg, I'd just like you to start the conversation in relation to something that you sent to us um, about limited referral and access to supportive care. Could you comment on that? Sure. Sure. Um, my, my experience and, and my sense of moving the discussion along um, in this regard is that, uh, as I alluded to in my talk, um, Within the private health system of cancer care, uh, there is virtually no such thing as supportive care. Um, I have never come across it. Um, it's never been offered to me. If I've ever needed any support of any sort, I've needed to seek it out for myself. Um, and as I suggested in earlier in, in my talk, um, it, I, I've been able to do that. Uh, I'm confident and I'm capable and able to um, to ask the questions and knock on the doors. My concern is that there are very, very many cancer patients and survivors in particular who may fall through the cracks of the system. Um, they're not, uh, these things are not offered to them. Nobody is asking them how they are, how they're doing. Um, and I wonder how, how the other panel members feel about how this may, may be changed within, within the system, whether it needs further education for, uh, for oncologists, for GPs, for practice nurses, um, what they might feel about it. Michael, you, you, uh, you did mention too in one of your uh, comments that you sent to us um, that, um, that, that, that there is a need for this. Is, is, is this just something that happens in the private system or, or does it happen in the public system as well? And, uh, could you comment on, on, on this aspect of care? 
I, I don't think I can speak for the whole of uh, the, either the private system or the public system, but um, I think that probably many of the people who are participating in this webinar would say that it's very patchy regardless of where you are. Um, some people uh, are lucky and they uh, come across um, an individual or a centre or a unit that has a particular focus on uh, trying to identify uh, issues and needs um, that people might have. And uh, Phyllis talked about the distress uh, thermometer and certainly in Victoria the Department of Health have been keen to, you know, and certainly in the oncology setting, to roll out um, screening for, for people affected by cancer. Now that might be people have chosen what sort of tools they want to use. The distress thermometer has the advantage of it being very brief. Um, others have used different tools. Um, and I guess that I would say that, you know, I would agree with Meg that we need to ensure that uh, this is front of mind and that it's not hit and miss, but everybody um, has an opportunity to talk about how they're feeling and to express a need. And whether that's through a needs assessment or a, a screening tool, uh, you know, and I guess the issue is whether or not that's a very brief screening tool or a more comprehensive screening tool, and we can certainly talk about that. And ideally, people should have their needs assessed repeatedly. I think that we'd probably all agree that, um, as David said, that uh, you know, at, at people might be told things at diagnosis, but that's a very stressful time and they're trying to take in a lot of things. And so we need to come back to people and ask them again. And particularly at critical points in the cancer journey, at, at, at initial diagnosis, at the end of treatment, at the time when disease might come back, um, at different phases. So, uh, yeah, does there, I, I would say that. Thanks so much. Thanks Michael, very much, Mike. David, here, you'd, you'd be uh, saying that a patient should, in fact, understand all the treatments they've received and have a clear sense of what's happened to them, what their cancer's all been about. And uh, you were talking about the treatment and survivor's care plan as a way of having that summarised. That care plan should uh, go out to GPs. Mm -hmm. uh, it should go to all of the people who have been involved in the person's treatment. But what do you think about the patient actually carrying that themselves, having their own copy of that, so that they're empowered to in fact uh, discuss that with any physician that they see in the future and, and use that as a tool to guide them as they go forward uh, in survivorship. Yep. So um, uh, look at the Institute of Medicine report and many others report um, argue strongly for the use of survivorship care plans and that the survivorship care plan as you suggest is uh, intended for all of the um, healthcare providers but critically is uh, an important tool for that particular survivor. Um, and whoever's close to them, I guess. Now, we've done work and, and so has and so have you and so has um, Phyllis about uh, how do we operationalise this? And, you know, if we think that there are potentially, let's say, over 700,000 survivors in Australia, uh, people start asking, well, how long does it take to summarise the treatment and how long does it take to um, do a needs assessment and how long does it take to discuss the care plan with a patient? And in Australia and in many parts of the world, people are saying it probably takes a couple of hours to do a treatment summary and an hour to discuss it. And do we have um, the time to do that? And that's, that's I think, the, um, a big challenge in terms of, I think we all believe that survivorship care plans are important. They're very important for both uh, survivors and for health professionals, but we need to work out how we can actually operationalise this. Uh, and a number of studies have also asked uh, GPs or primary care physicians, their views of the survivorship care plan and the Institute of Medicine care plan goes for about, um, you know, if you do all of that, it's about a 15-page document and most GPs say they want something that's a page or two. So we, we do need to work out how we can tailor the content to uh, particular, particularly to GPs and to survivors so that it's most useful for them. It's Phyllis here. I, I just like to also um, say though that I think it's really important that uh, there is very wide recognition and endorsement given to the importance of supportive care, um, and that means that it needs to be in guidelines that delivering this care and hospital accreditation, so that 
uh, people are rewarded for providing this sort of service. Uh, I think that's very important for the private um, sphere in particular. And until we have that sort of system-wide change, um, we're, we're not likely to get um, you know, real change. And I, I guess the other thing I'd like to pick up on from what you said, Michael, was um, that uh, we, we can look at ways of both uh, educating health professionals to ask these questions, and it often is just a quick question, uh, but we can also educate um, and provide patients with tools. And one of the things that we've um, developed and found to be very effective is giving patients a question prompt list. So a list of questions that they can ask that they might not have thought to ask themselves or that uh, you know other people have asked or wish they'd asked. Um, and looking at a list of questions like that can often empower people to think of things they might not have thought of or wouldn't have the courage to, to ask when they go and see a health professional. So I think there's sort of two, there's a number of approaches that are needed here, um, strategies that can empower people to look to ask for care and support when they need it, strategies to educate health professionals but also system changes that, that rewards health professionals for putting the time into um, these sorts of activities. Can I interrupt, Michael? That um, I couldn't agree more, Phyllis. And uh, Phyllis and David have been uh, international leaders in com communication skills training. So I th think that um, for the patient and survivor point of view, uh, question problem lists are, are, are a good tool. And we do have um, a question problem list on the ACSC website. And we've certainly been using question problem lists as a way of uh, for survivors to guide the conversation and guide um, what's important for them in consultations um, as, as a tool. Um, and I guess that in terms of um, getting back to Michael, your point um, that Meg had raised about uh, limited referral and access to supportive care, uh, how do we actually get clinicians uh, to, to ask? And, and Meg pleaded uh, that we need to be asking and uh, we're not listening, but uh, listening as well as asking. And I think that um, a lot of that is hopefully about uh, communication skills training and raising awareness. And, and you know, maybe Dave, David or Phyllis would like to talk a little bit, bit more about that. May I just interrupt here? It's uh, Michael Murray speaking. Uh, Craig Hassett's phone has disconnected. Uh, and as a GP, um, I'm sure he would uh, have much to say about care plans. So on his behalf, oh. um, I can empathise with, with that study that you did where, where, where GPs didn't want a 15-page document. And um, can you, is it possible to put it on one page? Well, yeah, okay. yeah, that's right. So and the question is, um, uh, what, yeah, look, I mean, I think that it is possible and we've done things like that. Uh, and some of the things that are included in the care plan around recommendations, that, which are uh, often uh, recommendations for health maintenance or chronic disease um, sort of principles. Um, when we've asked GPs, they'll say, well, this is our bread and butter. We do this every day. Um, you know, we talk to people about uh, exercise and stopping smoking and, uh, you know, support groups and these sorts of things. And so that information may not be critical for GPs. Um, so we do need to think about what's the information that we really want to be able to communicate to GPs, but also in a format that, is, that suits GPs because a, the Institute of Medicine idea of a survivorship care plan is not the idea of a survivorship care plan that most GPs in Australia have. Um, and so we now actually have Craig back online, so we'll just ask him to comment. Uh, we've just been talking about uh, survivorship, uh, survival care plans in an effort to coordinate care better and to get better assets out to survivors of cancer. Do you have any comments on that, Craig? Well, certainly GPs um, uh, are very time poor, like a lot of uh, health professionals. And so um, for GPs to get more actively involved, uh, it needs to be something that's simple without too much uh, red tape and um, uh, so that the, the time is really um, spent uh, with the patients and providing information and those gaps of, uh, uh, in their care and better coordination rather than um, spending a lot of time with the, the forms and the paperwork. 
I think too that, um, and I, I'm sorry I missed about the last five minutes of uh, conversation because uh, the phone line dropped out, but um, just to pick up on the, the last thing I heard too from, uh, from Meg when she was talking about the gaps in care, and I think that sometimes, and I, I know that um, Michael is uh, somebody who's very committed to providing a much broader um, approach to cancer care, but I think sometimes the medical model in its most limited form is very disempowering for patients because it's all about what the um, what the, uh, the the doctor, the therapist does, but very little about what the patient can do for themselves. And uh, I think that we really need to think a lot more about uh, helping people to be very active participants in their own health care, uh, to feel much more empowered so that it's a collaboration with their with their health practitioners, their GPs, their oncologists, um, psychologists, their allied health professionals that they're working with, so that the person feels like there's a lot that they can do. I think that uh, a learned helplessness and hopelessness is something that I certainly strike a lot of among cancer patients. It gets reinforced, especially when cancer patients say, well, what else can I do? How can I improve my outcome? How can I improve my coping? And the last thing's about, well, what about lifestyle and and uh, what about mental health and its impact on, on my, my well-being? And, and very often, I think far too commonly, um, it's, uh, it's more common than not that people are told, well, none of that really makes um, any significant difference. And uh, uh, some are discouraged from doing it. Some are say, oh, well, you know, um, do it if you want to. won't make any difference. And it's actually quite uncommon that people are, are actually encouraged to say, well, look, that's a really important part of your cancer care and I encourage you to get involved with that and here's some support programs that you can get involved with. I think we're not doing it well enough yet and I, I know that a lot on the panel are very conscious about a more holistic approach and um, I'm sure a lot of listeners are as well. And there was um, a senator, an Australian senator a few years ago um, had uh, very advanced melanoma and he he asked a lot of these kinds of questions of his health professionals. And he got, um, it wasn't that he wasn't helped, he was actually felt like he was stonewalled in terms of um, finding further information and accessing further uh, things that were outside of the square of what he was being offered in his cancer care. And, um, and I suppose Meg's a, an unusual example um, of a very uh, engaged, motivated patient. And I think this uh, Senator uh, Cook was a, a very unusual one as well because when you say something like that to somebody like him, he says, all right, well, he doesn't sort of uh, give up. He, what he does is he sets up a, uh, a centre of inquiry, which he did um, some years ago into the um, uh, into cancer management. And there were certainly 30, I think it was 32 recommendations, but they said a lot of these kinds of self-help, self-empowerment aspects of cancer care were being <clears throat> overlooked and there was a need for more information, more education for professionals, more information for patients, more access to support programs, so that it's a, and, and I think that this should be standard, not as an optional, that it's offered to everybody and that resources are made available and information available to everybody. So that's, a, I think, um, and I think that GPs are one of the people who can very much um, actively help in that area, um, add a lot of value, um, and I think that we're, not doing that or not educated to do that, um, uh, I think, to satisfaction yet. May I just uh, move on just a little bit now? Because one of our learning objectives is to explore tips and strategies for collaborative care for people who survive cancer and maybe experience depression and or anxiety. And um, Barbara Nettlebeck, who one of our um, uh, participants, has asked a really good question. My experience as a counsellor is that some clients are well organised, have their own file, and accessible knowledge about the history, we can facilitate this level of empowerment. Others are disorganized and don't really have a cohesion about their stories. So I think what Barbara's talking about is disease versus existential, ex existential angst. How do we cope with that and, and anxiety and depression which occur in the normal course of life? Of life? Does the panel have any any idea, anything to say about that? Uh, it's Phyllis here. Um, I might just start a, by talking a little bit about um, the existential distress that people experience when they worry about the cancer coming back. And I think um, that sort of anxiety is quite different to some of the anxiety you get as a, norm, as a 
uh, everyday person who may not have had cancer because it's not illogical. Um, you know, people do have a uh, uh, some risk of the cancer coming back. So um, cognitive behaviour therapy, which has been used very widely for anxiety, doesn't always work in this instance because that relies on challenging the... Um, I guess the sense, the sensibleness of, of those sorts of thoughts. But in the, for a cancer patient, they do really uh, face a risk of cancer recurrence. So some of the approaches that we've been um, exploring recently um, are what's called meta-cognitive approaches where, where you support people in not, not challenging their worries, their, their direct thoughts about the cancer coming back, but actually challenging the value of worry but um, because some people feel that if they're not worrying all the time, they're leaving themselves vulnerable and they feel that they have to worry, that it's um, important for them to worry and to pay attention to, those, to that worry. Whereas, uh, you know, they may on reflection choose to say to themselves, well, I'm going to worry for half an hour a day, but for the other 23 and a half hours, I won't worry because then I can get on with my life and I'll do all the effective worry that I need to do in that half an hour. Um, or... You know, so so I guess it's challenging the value of worry and um, giving empowering them to take control of that anxiety so that it doesn't um, affect the rest of their lives. But David might like to comment on this as Thanks, well. Thanks, Phyllis. Yes, I'd, li I'd like to add to that. Um, cognitive behavioural therapy often uses the yardstick of what's logical, what's rational, and in cancer care, that uh, nice doesn't nice. work. It's, it's much more the principle of what's realistic that I think we try and uh, ask people to examine. So that if you get a pain, for example, if you've been gardening and you've got a good reason for that pain, uh, you're able to say it's realistic that my back's uh, a bit sore after gardening uh, and it should go away in a, in a day or two. And so you can look at the timeline and think, well, realistically, if a pain is persisting over a couple of weeks, then I should be back to my GP and uh, having it investigated. And so you're putting that realistic uh, emphasis on it as a way of working out how to manage it and how to come to terms with it. A common journey for so many cancer patients is anxiety prior to their next scan, their next uh, round of imaging. And uh, that's a, a pretty normal experience, but it's important for us to emphasize to them that as they find that their scans are normal, uh, as you were saying, it's not going to help them to allow that worry to be dominant uh, for every time they have to have further imaging. And so that's an example, I think, of your idea of how, how much does the worry cost you? Can you put some of that aside? Can you start to pick a very common sense approach to how you handle any fear over a symptom? and uh, keep it very realistic based. And I, um, David and uh, Phyllis, uh, it's Craig Hassett here. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to um, uh, endorse what you've been saying and perhaps just uh, add a little bit to that as well. I think that um, that's one of the things about mindfulness-based approaches, whether it's NBCT or ACT, it, um, there's a couple of things that are very important that it helps to give a person a choice um, not by fighting with the thoughts that they might be trying not to have or the emotions, but to be able to be aware of them and to be more consciously able to choose to engage with them or to engage with something else. And the acceptance bit, which is very central in these approaches, I think is very important because having a thought or a feeling that we feel that we shouldn't be having, but which may be entirely understandable and natural, um, the, the reactivity to it and the judging of it uh, really totally preoccupies the attention with it and and uh, makes it even more intrusive than it would otherwise be. And so paradoxically, um, uh, learning to soften the uh, attitude to those emotions and to learn to feel more comfortable in the presence of them uh, helps a person not to feel dominated by them, but to learn to live with them, um, to then be less and less affected by them and to engage more and more fully with the life that the person does have to lead. And so... I think that um, you know, I'd just like to very much endorse what you were saying before and, uh, and uh, encourage people to learn the strategies that can help people to do that. Thank you very much. May I just ask you, Meg, um, how the, the, the conversation we've been having over the previous five to 
seven minutes resonates with you as a cancer survivor and, and, and as a survivorship center volunteer? Sure. Um, I've been reflecting while I've been listening to um, to my fellow panelists talking about how I came to um, to um, work around my own um, anxieties and emotional state as I was going through cancer treatments and various stages of survivorship in between. Um, new diagnoses. Um, for me, I, um, I, I developed a, a, a strategy of um, dealing with one, one thing at a time, one diagnosis, one scan, one treatment, not trying not to, um, to worry about things that were too far into the future that I couldn't have any impact on. Um, to preserve, um, to preserve, and and um, and try and re retain my energies by not worrying about the what ifs um, and only dealing with what I knew and what I was able to cope with. Um, and I suppose that that leads me into um, reflecting on what Craig's been talking about because over the journey, what I found helpful was. Um, with my first diagnosis, I sought um, help and, and training in relaxation. With my second, I, I stepped it up to um, to learn about meditation. And when I, before I had my transplant, I found that what I looked for was something that would help me even more. And I learned about. Um, about self-hypnosis so that I was able to actually employ relaxation and mindfulness te techniques to help me. So the conversation that um, that has been occurring, I understand and identify with um, exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, I, if, if there was a way to um, to pass that information on to other cancer patients and survivors, that's, that's the journey that I'm on, trying to help them. And that's what I do um, in my work with the Cancer Council, with their Cancer Connect program, I, um, I, which is a peer support program. I speak to other people who are in similar situations to myself. And... Uh, by being able to do that, by helping them know that I understand where they are, what they're experiencing, I understand their 2am what ifs, um, that gives them some hope and, and some calm as well. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's my, my sense. Michael, can I um, just uh, add something there and I think that... Um, you know, Meg talking about the support she can give to other people is just critical and it's quite clear that um, the opportunity, opportunity to, talk to talk to someone else who's been through the same experience is so valuable. I did want to raise as well though that I think women are a lot better at um, asking for support and going for this sort of support than men. Um, and men can quietly uh, suffer or turn to other strategies like alcohol, um, perhaps more so than, than women who are more used to perhaps asking for help. And I think that uh, we, in this modern day and age, we've got an opportunity through the web to engage with men in ways that they might not be willing to take up as, as a face-to-face -face interaction with either another person with cancer or with a health professional. And, and, and there are now increasingly websites for um, people going through cancer treatment and also in survivorship who are starting to try and uh, deliver these sorts of skills and uh, give people education and support around how to manage their fears of the cancer coming back and other issues in survivorship. And I think we'll see more of those um, in the years to come. But I think the issues for men are perhaps require a different approach. I don't know what whether other people would like to comment on that. I, um, uh, could, I, could I just have a quick uh, comment from Michael Jefford because time has gone by. Um, I know. <laughs> we, we have a very short time left. So Michael, just a, just a mad minute on, on men versus, versus women 
uh, responses to uh, therapy um, approaches. Oh, I'm I'm going to be. Um, I'm going to be a politician and take the opportunity to speak about something else. I think uh, I just want to I want to follow on from uh, what Phyllis has just said. I would have done it a little bit more skillfully, but um, but uh, I think that what uh, Phyllis has highlighted though is the need to harness as much support and as as many resources as possible. Um, so you know, that might be through support groups, it might be through peer support that Meg's talked about, like the Cancer Connect program. Um, sorry, it's, it's Michael Jefford talking, sorry, the webinar people. Um, so, uh, and I think that we're not going to be able to provide comprehensive care cancer, to uh, cancer, cancer, survivors. cancer survivors without harnessing um, all of these different strategies. And Craig's talked about the sorts of things that people can do for themselves as individuals. Um, and Phyllis has talked about the need to be able to connect with people, uh, as has Meg, um, and that might be. But it also uh, talks about the need to um, to think about accessing people through through people on accessing people online, uh, but also using other resources, which might be cancer councils. I noticed in the chat uh, area, people were talking about Carers um, Carers Victoria and uh, other state equivalents. Uh, but trying to harness as much support as we can. Uh, ideally not in a, a just a complete um, fragmented hit and miss way because um, what we're trying to do is to do this in a much more systematic way that identifies that some people don't need that sort of support but other people yep. do and, and trying to tailor this so that we can identify individual issues, needs, uh, predicted problems and then anticipate those things and tailor a program of support for that person. Thank you. So I, didn't, I didn't answer the question about men versus women. No, that's fine. Maybe you should become a politician. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, we, we're just coming towards the end um, of tonight's webinar. I'm going to ask each panelist to sum up in two minutes. Uh, to reflect and sum up. I'm, I'm actually going to go in reverse order from, from how we started. I'm going to ask you, David, to, to sum up first in two minutes, please. Thanks very much, Michael. Yes, sir. Yes, I think empowering our patients is a very important uh, philosophical stance for clinicians to adopt and to recognize the process of uh, tailoring what we work out uh, to meet their needs. Um, we've heard Craig uh, emphasize the benefits of mindfulness-based uh, cognitive therapy, stress reduction therapy, uh, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy has been talked about. Uh, people have mentioned narrative therapies, meaning-centered therapies, um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, uh, it's, uh, from my perspective, uh, a clinician's responsibility to try and identify what is going to suit the individual patient and tailor the selection of the model of therapy to respond to their needs. And that's part of the clinical arc, uh, art of working out what uh, is going to be the most helpful uh, approach to support a person and to connect them to community supports and to ensure that they're well educated and empowered therefore uh, to adapt and to cope with their survivorship uh, period. Thanks Michael. Thank you very much David. And now Phyllis in two minutes may I ask you to uh, sum up? Um, well, I suppose what I'd like to end up with is uh, a, just a comment on the importance of um, this area for all of us and the need for all of us to advocate for improved supportive care services and certainly um, people like Meg and other um, people who have survived cancer are, are, are in a very powerful position to advocate for these things as well as health professionals. Um, and it's only through that sort of advocacy that we can get system change that really incorporates supportive care into cancer, uh, you know, into holistic cancer care. And I think that's just critical. So I'd just like to put in a last plug for us to all think about how we can um, really bring this out into prominence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phyllis. And Craig, in two minutes, may I ask you to sum up, please? Uh, yes, there are a few points that um, I'd just like to make in clo uh, closing. The continuity um, from hospital to community and to have that resource so that people can provide the kinds of services that uh, we've been speaking of. Uh, just secondly, in terms of um, these kinds of more holistic approach, um, 
these sorts of things can only be offered that can't be imposed on people. And so I think through informing and gently working with the person, person's motivation, uh, their interests, that the approach is individualised for that person and it's not one size that fits all, but it's a flexible healthcare system and practitioners that can help adapt all of the, the possibilities that could be available for that person in a way that's meaningful for them. One of the things that I hope is that um, we never put people in a difficult situation um, through some kind of turf war that people are being asked to either choose what's seen as a, a conventional healthcare approach or maybe some kind of a, um, a integrated approach that's uh, seen as being alternative. For me, it's not about anything that's alternative. It's about making our conventional healthcare more holistic uh, and making sure that um, any kinds of things that are outside of um, the usual care are evidence-based and supportive, but that we move towards not two different systems and people have to choose, but one integrated system that helps individuals. Now, very briefly, the last thing I'd say as well is that I, I do believe, obviously being passionate about mindfulness, that uh, mindfulness is as important for the therapist as it is for the patient. Firstly, so that we can be more mindful in the consultation and listen better and more openly to our patients and engage them better, but also so that we care for ourselves and we help to prevent care of fatigue or care of burnout, particularly when we're working in areas like cancer or mental health where those kinds of uh, issues can be very real for, for, the, for the carer. So we need to care for patients and that includes caring for ourselves so we can turn up for them and be present with our patients every day. Thank you very much, Greg. Very good points. And Michael, may I ask you to sum up? Sure. Um, not so much summing up. I, I'd agree with everything that people have said before, and uh, unfortunately it's harder when you have to go towards the end. You can say, well, everyone said what I was going to say. But uh, <laughs> I, I, had, I had noticed that in the... Uh, I would like to... I mean, Meg works with, uh, with us at the Survivorship Centre and works as hard as everybody else. You just do just the only difference is we don't pay her. Um, but uh, in the general chat room, we, we heard a lot about... Um, uh, how important it is to hear the voice of consumers and survivors, and I think that Meg has been able to, you know, the, share her experience and highlight um, the sorts of issues that survivors can experience. Uh, the fact that the the path isn't clear, that that, that it's um, very fragmented, very hit and miss, um, and and I guess that that highlights to us that we've got a way to go. She highlighted the need to listen. Uh, but to also to ask. And I, and I think that sometimes it can feel overwhelming to think, well, how do we provide uh, this care when you know, there's a, there's a, there's, there is a big gap um, and it will take some time. And Phyllis talks about the need for system, change, system level change, and I, I absolutely agree with that. I think, though, that there are things that we can do right now. And it is surprisingly, uh, as a clinician, uh, I'm um, not a psycho-oncology professional, but uh, uh, it is surprisingly helpful to be able to provide people with information, uh, to put them in touch with other people who have been in a similar situation, to normalise the sorts of experiences that people uh, encounter in the post-treatment phase. That To me, it seems, uh, it's one of the, the nice things that it seems like a, a, a useful intervention, but it's so simple. Uh, and it struck me for the whole of my career that why don't people pr provide um, patients and survivors with information or link them to free services in the community. So I think that they, they would be some of the things that we, we can do right now. I would absolutely um, agree with what Craig was saying about, we know the, the benefit of exercise for survivors is absolutely, there's no, there's no doubt that exercise has broad ranging benefits, including uh, in a number of studies, reducing the chance of cancer coming back. So we have to find a way to promote um, exercise as a really important intervention. Um, I, I thought I had nothing to say, and now I'm going on for hour. Um, I'd also um, talk about this has been an exercise, uh, I think, for all of us, including myself, in sort of awareness raising and thinking about the issues. And, and as Phil has suggested, we do need to uh, continue to raise the awareness of the importance of supportive care, but also the importance of more holistic care, not just during the treatment phase, but in the post-treatment phase. Um, and I guess that I would highlight that, again, something that we can do uh, as of tomorrow is to 
be more aware and also to start thinking about what, what sort of screening tools can we use, even if, it's, uh, it, if we decide that it's going to be asking about how you're feeling and, uh, yes. and something simple, uh, and then we might think about well, whether we could incorporate a screening tool. Uh, yes. There's the sorts of things I think we can do as of tomorrow. That's so they're important. just a few points. Thank you very, very much. Meg, we'll, 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 we'll let you sum up last. Okay. Uh, uh, I suppose what I want to say is we've, we've, we've all talked around many issues tonight. For me, next steps are important. How these issues are going to be translated into action. My story highlights the fact that while after so many years some things have changed, many remain the same and survivors are often left to find their own way and to advocate for themselves. I'm grateful that opportunities such as tonight's webinar are created to bring together so many professionals who are interested in and who are working towards improving the well-being of the increasing number of cancer survivors in our community. And to finish, I am indeed lucky to have found my voice to help smooth the roller coaster ride for other survivors, and I'm grateful to have been able to be part of tonight's discussion. Thanks, Michael. Thanks very much, Meg, and you're not as grateful as we are to have you here tonight. <laughs> I, you. I am now. I normally, um, when I'm when I'm summing up, I normally just have a few little. I have a, a, a four and a half page here of points, which I probably won't get through. But I'm just going to give you some standbys from what I hear tonight. Uh, survivorship, care plans, and um, the psychological e element. We need to be working with evidence. We need to be having surveillance, both medical and psychosocial. We need to have good coordination. We need to have continuity. We need to remember about spirituality and mindfulness. We need to, have to make integrated care normal care. That should be the norm. Uh, the existential issues, the value of worry, um, the, how the system sometimes fails us, the physical effects, the psychological distress, um, the, uh, and also and the also use, the of, use of, 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 of that which I wasn't aware of. I normally use a, an electronic thermometer now, but that distress thermometer um, it seems to me very useful, and I'll certainly be Googling that tomorrow. Um, I, I, I was particularly taken by the, the concepts of worry and, uh, and mindfulness. And lastly, may I say that one thing that came through from everybody's talk was ask the patient. Uh, and there's an old saying in general practice that uh, there's more myths from not looking than from not knowing. Um, and I think there's more myths from not, list, from not asking than from not knowing. So they are the elements that, um, that, uh, that came to me. Well, uh, well said, Michael. So um, I, for so I've had uh, computer problems all day, and I, I, I'm unable to see anything. Uh, in finishing, I would like uh, to thank everybody for their participation from the bottom of my heart, and I'm sure from the bottom of all our hearts, because everybody is involved in this tonight, both participants and, and presenters, sound as if they have heart. Uh, which is which is very important in caring for people, and I I accept uh, Craig's comment about, about care fatigue as well. Uh, and can you please make sure that you fill in any of your responses that should be filled in for MHPN? I I cannot see anything online at the moment. Uh, it is now 8:13, so we have approximately one minute left. Um, the uh, other points that I heard tonight uh, were the importance of, of looking at people who are survivors as also developing other illnesses, not uh, both from their treatment and also from, from, from the normal course of their life, uh, and that they shouldn't really be treated any differently from other patients. Um, I would like to thank everybody from the bottom of my heart for attending tonight. I'm sorry I'm unable to see any of the uh, remaining slides. Uh, please contact MHPN and please fill, fill out your evaluation at the end of the webinar. And on behalf of MHPN, 
um, and everybody involved in this field and on behalf of the participants, I would like to thank the panel very, very much for their expertise um, and presentations tonight. So that will bring this webinar to a close. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.